The BS Report is presented by Subway. Football season is over. Footlong season is just beginning. For a limited time, get any piled high regular footlong for just $5. Any footlong, just $5. Hurry in, Subway. Eat fresh. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome back to the BS Report. We had to split this one up into two parts. I had on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline our former ESPN.com ombudsman, Leanne Schreiber. We talked about newspapers in part one. This discussion is all about ESPN, ESPN.com, her ombudsman job, and the direction of the company creatively in general. So here we go. Let's talk about ESPN. Okay. Because I promised I wouldn't keep you for too long. So you had the job for two years. Yeah. You liked having the job. Yes, I did. You enjoyed yourself, correct? Yes, I did. Um, were you surprised that the, you know, the, the response that I got, like uh, on the blogosphere, which you know, loves to loves to pick on almost everybody. You were, you became this beloved figure. It was kind of funny. It was fun, and I was I was very surprised because, um, you know, one of my great reservations, you know, uh, in undertaking this uh, when it was broached was, you know, an ombudsman is supposed to be the the representative, you know, and yeah. there could be nobody demographically, you know, farther away from the young male demographic, you know, than me. Um, you know, I, you know, it's like ombuds granny. And uh, <laughs> it just, you know, and I thought I would be very far removed, you know, not only in years, but in sensibility. Um, uh, you know, how could I represent, you know, this demographic and when I was announced uh, you know when uh, ESPN announced that I was the ombudsman they gave my bio and whatever I mean I, I noticed the blog started filling up with like could they have chosen anybody worse you know right. who is this old lady you know how could she represent um, and then it was quick as soon as I started writing the columns it turned around and I think I think one of the things that probably facilitated a quick turnaround and uh particularly the blogosphere being able to say well maybe maybe you can't judge her by that gray head was uh I mean literally the day after I posted my uh first column just kind of you know this the, the meet the ombudsman this is who I am and this is how I'm going to approach it the the next day was when um, the incident of Colin Cowherd shutting down the big lead. Oh, yeah, calling yeah. on his, you know, radio listeners to shut it down for fun. He basically inundated them with, with traffic. And, yes. And it you shut know, down the bandwidth. Overwhelmed the bandwidth, yeah. And they were down for three, four days. And this was done as kind of like just a cute trick. And, you know, that and my... You know, ombuds mailbag started, you know, filling up uh, with some, you know, just outrage about this, and I thought it was outrageous. I mean, I just thought it was one of the most outrageous abuses of uh, ESPN's power that I could imagine. So, I didn't really have a mandate. I mean, I was supposed to write a monthly column, and that's what I was going to do pretty much, you know, for the rest of the tenure. But this this incident seemed so outrageous, even though it was my first day on the job. I went out, bingo. Um, and wrote a response to that and just kind of, uh, said how stupid I thought, you know, stupid, destructive, you know, inexcusable I thought it was. And I think the blogosphere said, well, she's sticking up for us. Mm. And it, that, I, I think that very early on, uh, that that incident happened on literally the first day of my, um, public tenure as ombudsman. 
um, made people set aside uh, the prejudices, the preconceptions they were about to bring to the yeah. old lady ombudsman, and then from there on, it was I think a surprise to everybody, myself included, how similar in sensibility and response, uh, you know, to what we consumed on ESPN and ESPN.com. I turned out to be with this demographic, and I, and I, it was very um, heartening to me uh, to find out that you know you could be a 20-year-old college student or you could be me, um, but if you cared about what you were, you know, if you were, if you really cared about what it was you were watching or reading or whatever. Um, that was enough of a bond to to reduce the difference in sensibility. Well, there's that old tired joke about how bloggers are just dudes living in their mom's basement. You're kind of mom. You were the <laughs> you were the mom, and they were in the basement. So maybe it was like a natural natural connection or something. You know, I talked to John Walsh about this in Friday's podcast a little bit, and you know, he's just convinced that everyone makes too much about the television announcers and, you know, but the media's relationship to the games and that it's all overblown. And, and I respectfully disagree with him because, you know, I, I think what, what sometimes ESPN fails to understand is the viewers don't have a choice. If they're watching an NBA game and we're giving them these three announcers or an NFL game and we're giving them these three announcers, they don't have any other announcers to listen to. And those announcers become part of their experience for better or worse. So, you know, like it or not, that's a topic I'm going to talk about with my friends. And I think sometimes we stick our heads in the sands a little bit with that stuff. Because on the other hand, when we when we change the three-man booth, we, it becomes a big deal. And we're doing interviews about it and we're doing all this press about it. So it's like you can't promote this and then claim that it's not a big deal. That's what I never understood. Well, um, I see it more as you do. I mean, and this may be just a function of my perch because I was the, you know, recipient of two years worth of, you know, fan complaints. But also just as a viewer myself, um, um, you know, it's sort of like back to the Catholic Church. Um, ESPN is the intermediary between the fan in sports, I mean, you literally can't watch it or be informed about it except through the agency of ESPN. Yeah. Um, so uh, the sports fan uh, who's interested in, well, both for, both for events, I mean, whether you're watching the events or whether you want to know the news on a league-wide uh, basis or and a sports-to-sport basis, you're hostage to ESPN. Yeah. And particularly, I think it's very pronounced with announcers. I mean, the announcers um, have an extraordinary impact on how you can experience the game. And, and ESPN is the only way you can experience the game, and the announcers have a tremendous impact on it. And um, so I think they care a lot about who the announcers are and how they're operating. I received almost no complaints, for instance, about uh, very few complaints about play-by-play announcers. Yeah. They usually have good radio voices, you know. Uh, They usually know the game. They're usually, you know, they're facilitators. You need them. Um, But the analysts and color commentators you know, there were a lots of complaints about them, and they all come down to essentially one thing. Uh, you're too much of a presence between us and the game. Yeah, you overshadow either, it. Yeah, you're either talking so much. Um, well, certainly anything like, you know, a booth guest or a phone interview with some coach of a team that's not playing you know, uh, in, which happened a lot in college football, um, talk about topics other than what was happening on the field. All of those things would, would bring in complaints. Um, but, I mean, all the complaints really kind of 
boil down to one, which is, you know, you're not giving us a, you know, you're not letting us have enough of a direct experience of this game, which is what we tuned in for. But the people you're hearing from, they're not going to email you and say, I just want to tell you, I think Mike Breen's doing a good job. I mean, that email box is predisposed to getting complaints. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, but you, you know, but you get more and less complaints. If you get no complaints, that's good, you know. Um, and I, <laughs> I agree. Like, that's what I do when I, after I write a column, I know, I know I did a good job if I don't get any emails telling me that, you know, complaining about it or saying, that's that stunk or whatever. It's the silence is what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. And I must say, um, the NBA. Uh, I mean, the you know Breen. Dan Gundy Gundy and Jackson. Jackson yeah. um, got less. I, I got fewer complaints about professional basketball. Now, uh, you know, I don't. Uh, I, I can't say, you know, you never know exactly what that means. It maybe is, you know, basketball fans aren't used to writing the ombudsman, you know. Um, but I got fewer complaints there. Well, they, they're, they're arguably, you know, one of the best three or four three-man booths ever in televised sports. So I, I would say that was be, and, that would be because and of that. And that's the way I felt about it. Yeah. In other words, because, you know, you know, as ombudsman, I'd have my... I'd have my own reactions as a viewer, okay, and I couldn't go completely on, you know, I couldn't go on that, but when my reactions as a viewer dovetailed with the, you know, messages that I would get in the uh, ombuds mailbag and would dovetail with what the mainstream media, media critics were saying and what the blogosphere was saying, you had a pretty certain lineup. Right. Um, that something is bothering people or is bothering a very, very significant section of ESPN's audience. What did you think of what I talked to John Walsh about, about that, I, that my personal biggest, I don't know if it's a fear or I just don't quite understand it about ESPN is that they're, they care so much about being a media entity and reporting news and, you know, being on top of things and having the best editors and the best reporters, breaking stories. And then on the other hand, you know, we, we have the Budweiser hot seat and the, the Coors Light top five and all that other stuff. By the way, Leanne Schreiber being brought to you on the Subway Fresh Tech Hotline. Um, we have all these sponsors that we, that we bring in and I mean, how do you find that balance between making money and making news? Or breaking well, news, I should say. Yeah, that's the trick. Um, you know, the the argument would be made that okay, you have a sponsored segment. Um, what you do on that segment um, better be something that is justifiable in and of itself as news. Um, Did you feel they were, that was consistently the case? Uh, no, I felt it was variable, and I but I felt it was actually getting better. Um, that that you know maybe they just broke them up into smaller segments. I mean, but I remember uh, you know two years ago when there'd be one of those sponsored segments, it might run for five or six minutes, you know. Yeah. Um, and it might be very softball or speculative questions that you know didn't seem. You know, they they were arbitrary. Uh, you didn't need that uh, segment on this day of this news. And I, but I I believe in the last year or so they made those segments shorter, or at least they uh, split them up much, uh, split them up more into different segments. Uh, you know, across the hour of Sports Center, so they weren't quite as interruptive. But Sports Center is a news show, like it, like you know, no, I'm no other news shows basically have these rackets to make money during the show. Like I like I mean just from an aesthetic standpoint, like maybe that stuff shouldn't be in there at all? Well from a news standpoint, I mean from a traditional strict news point they shouldn't be in there at all. I mean that but this is you know, this is this shifting front 
where advertisers, uh, not just at ESPN, uh, I've seen this on um, on network news, where a pharmaceutical company will be sponsoring a health segment, and it makes me that's presented in the news, and it makes me very very nervous. But sort of like uh, the gold standard for advertisers, and I think this is magnified by a period of DVRing. I watch a lot by DVR, and you zip right past those commercials, right? Yeah. So I think they're trying to, you know, uh, embed the advertising more seamlessly and surreptitiously into the editorial content so that you can't, um, you know, so that you can't just whiz by them. And it's a slippery slope. Yeah, uh, but like I, when Jimmy Kimmel does it at the beginning of his show, it's an entertainment show. And they're doing comedy skits with like, you know, the Sprite or whatever, whatever they're doing. If I'm supposed to be watching a show that I'm getting news information from, from an allegedly objective source, it just seems like I'm not sure the sponsor should be in there. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, their case would be, well, how are we going to pay for this stuff? Mm -hmm. My counter would be, don't we make enough money from the cable deals that we have that we shouldn't, you know, also feel obligated to rake it in with our new show? Like, you know, at what point do we have on Outside the Lines, Bob Lee talking about the Duke lacrosse scandal, and then, you know, somehow Sprite is involved in, or whatever sponsor. Like, that's what worries me. I don't know where, where do you draw the line? So we say outside the line, well, we won't do this with outside the lines or the sports reporters, but Sports Center, that's fair game. That's what I don't get. Well, I mean, I think they have to be, I think ESPN needs to be very, very careful with Sports Center because, um, it's, you know, it's the heart of their news credibility. Yeah. So I think they have to be asking themselves continuously very hard questions about the issues of sponsored segments, about issues of, you know, self and cross promotion. Um, I don't think they know the answer because I, I think we saw with with Who's Now and the Mount Rushmore and that kind of stuff. Like, I think they feel like it's also an entertainment show that needs to get ratings, and maybe that is the problem. Is that they're approaching it as an entertainment show that, that is supposed to make money and get ratings on one side. But on the other side, it's a news show. And it's got breaking news and it's got opinions on news. And I really don't think you can be both. I mean, I just that's my personal take. I don't think you can juggle both of those balls at the same time. What do I know? Well, you know, they've been juggling them for a long time and pretty <laughs> successfully. But I think the encroachment, I mean, I was very, I'm also, you know, I also, um, the new ESPN.com. There's yeah. some things there that 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 trouble me. You know, like on um, on the bottom. There's that bottom inside ESPN. Yeah. Which features, uh, you know, it, it's sort of news and feature stories. But every once in a while, there'll be an ad in there. There'll be an infomercial. Hmm. That, you know, you know, maybe nine out of ten of them, uh, you'll click, uh, and it'll take you to, um, you know, ESPN content written by ESPN people. And then I was kind of shocked, you know, last week I clicked on something that was about automobiles, and it took me to a site, um, that was about luxury automobiles. And so, one of those slots in the Batam Gallery was being sold to advertising, but presented entirely in an indistinguishable way from the editorial content. They went, oh, no. Um, Just think, if you had stayed, you could have been the Toyota Ombudsman. Exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> and it's hard for me to say. You know, I don't know what, um, you know, and in, in the new... You know, one of the clear functions of the new um, ESPN.com is to provide a, a you know main page that's more congenial to advertising. Yeah. But you've given up some things. You know, like um, uh, news. You know, news. 
if you're a news junkie like me, uh, you know, you have that little headline square in the upper right, and that's mm-hmm. about, you know, it for, you know, just pure news. But on the old ESPN.com, there used to be a thing where you could go more headlines, and you could click, and then, you know, it wasn't just whatever, you know, the, the 10 that you can get in that box. You could go, you, you know, you get 20 or 30 news stories. Um, now there's no more headlines. You know, so you don't know what you've missed. You know, if you've if you've been out of the loop for two or three days and want to come back and see what what the news has been, you don't have any way to get at it. Um, you could go to particular sports pages, you know, on particular sports and maybe find it, but you don't know what you're not seeing. Um, right. It's hard. You know, if I if I were, um, you know, if I were so ombuds, I would probably be taking a hard look at what's gained and lost in the new ESPN.com uh, homepage. But well, I'm sure a lot of it is determined by what kind of revenue they can get from advertising. And I realize that one of the biggest problems with the Internet is trying to find, you know, business models that really pay for your, pay for itself. Yeah, I'm not as down on it as... You know, as as uh, the sports center stuff, just because, you know, I, I think they kind of made a mistake to some degree with the way the old setup was. Like, you do want to have a couple big banners and ads, and you do want to be able to pay for some of the stuff you have on the site. And it's an expensive site. We got a lot of people working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and unlike Sports Center, which I really feel like is a news show, I think ESPN.com is trying to be a whole bunch of things. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's that's a little or a little more palatable. But, you know, I th- I don't want it to seem like I'm complaining about ESPN because, you know, I had the thing with John Walsh on Friday where I was doing my grapes. I think that the reason that I care, not just beyond just the fact that I work for this company and I've worked for them for eight years, is it's a big part of my life. You know, you're a sports fan. ESPN is a huge part of your life, whether, whether you like that or not. And yeah. like anything else that's in your life, you think about, man – I wish they didn't do this, or I wish they didn't do that. I do that with my daughter. <laughs> you know, I, w- I wish my daughter would take a nap during the afternoon. So I, I feel like it's the same kind of thing. I think if people didn't care, that would almost be more dangerous. That would yeah, tell me no, that they'd I give mean, it up. One of the things that uh, struck me as soon as I undertook this job was how passionately people feel about ESPN. Yeah. And how much they feel it is their television station, their, you know, website. I mean, they feel a real sense of ownership. ownership. Yeah. And they are, which is what, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You know, it, it creates the love-hate, you know. So uh, they take it very personally when they feel their values or their interests aren't being well served. The only thing comparable in my experience was how when I worked at the New York Times Book Review, uh, people in the world of, you know, publishing and books and writers uh, felt that intensely about the book review because it was had so much power and influence for good or ill on the fate of any particular book um, uh yeah, that was that it, you know that that any misstep you know uh, got you just you know excoriated um, and people seem to you know the only that's the only equivalent I could think of for how intensely people react to ESPN I would throw because in the they feel myth- it has so much impact in their lives. Yeah, I would throw in, like you used the Times example. I th- didn't the same go for, like, Pauline Kael's movie reviews or Let's the, uh, Pauline, the Broadway yeah, guy? Well, uh, the Broadway guy especially. The, yeah. uh, the theater reviewer at the Times was, you know, you know, whether it was the day of Frank Rich or, you know, people before him. They had such an extraordinary impact on the fate of any particular production. They had too much power. Yeah. You know, they didn't even particularly want that power. They just had it, you know. Same was true of the book review. You didn't necessarily want the power. You had it uh, by virtue of the lack of significant competition. So ESPN is like that in, to some degree. To some extent. I mean, yeah. um, 
although I think they want it. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got it. And on the other hand, the other thing, you know, coming back to if if an e, if ESPN had existed in its present form or anything like it back when I was a newspaper sports editor, I could have produced such a better sports section. Yep. Um, one because it 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 partly frees you from doing certain things that you have to do. Um, and the other part is that it is so broadened the information and knowledgeability of the sports fan um, and the availability of information and events uh, that it is, you know, it is just so wildly changed the landscape for better for the fans that um, I think we lose sight of that. I mean, I certainly lost, I would lose sight of it. But, when I was being ombudsman because I would be sitting there, you know, receiving, you know, hundreds of mail day in and day out of, you know, uh, discontented, angry uh, people, many of whom were too, are too young to remember what it was like without ESPN. Right. You know, but. Well, you talked about that power that ESPN has. You know, the the one time that I really felt like, we just kind of misinterpreted how to use that power or maybe overrated it to some degree was the way we handled the 2008 um, presidential primaries and the fact that we basically decided to divest ourselves completely from it. Um, and regardless of how that affected me, because I could have had Barack Obama on my podcast in April and basically was told that I couldn't, um, it, it just seemed to me almost conceded on the company's part that we were so big, we don't want to swing this election. Oh, I don't think they thought that. No, 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 no. What do you I don't think, think they felt? No, I think what I I think they felt two things. Um, that they have, uh, you know, that they have a constituency, an audience uh, that you know exists across the whole political spectrum, and and. You know, so if somebody is a Republican and they see Obama on, it angers them. If somebody's a Democrat, they see McCain on, it angers them. Um, so I don't think they thought that they would swing it. I think that they thought that no, you know, no matter how you engage in 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 even just acknowledging political campaigns, you're going to uh, provoke and anger a sizable part of your audience, and also must. Do you agree with that, though? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I agree. I think that's true. Yes. And see, I, also, see. I have to say, as ombudsman, all of the mail, all of the mail, I would get about uh, whether it was about the um, even the bracket. You know, you know, President Obama's recent NCAA bracket. Uh, I got some mail on, um, or whether it was various appearances by either McCain or Obama on ESPN during the campaign, it was always, we watch ESPN to get away from that stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, take somebody like me, I'm supposed to write this column that I'm, right, I'm supposedly, hopefully, writing from the perspective of the average sports fan. At least that's what I try to do. But, you know, in, the, in October, Sarah Palin does her first, what, her speech at the Republican convention, which was watched by something like 50 million people. And I'm not allowed to even reference it two days later in a column at all. Like that, it just seems weird to me if, if I'm supposed to talk about everything in my column, but that's hands off. Well, what I would say is that it, it's a, it's a clear handicap for you. Yeah. Because you, you know, the territory you've carved out as a columnist, you know, spans sports and popular culture and, you know, national culture, and it is a clear handicap for you not to be able to um, uh, you know, make those references. Forget about weighing in on the opinions, just even make the references, you know, when everybody else in that turf uh, that you cover uh in popular culture is, you know, it's a definite handicap. But I do understand that you make a Sarah Palin joke, it's going to anger uh, 
a significant portion of ESPN's, you know, audience, and they, you know, say they decided it's not going to be worth it to them. But the, but then, like, somebody like Barkley could say something on TNT. Yeah. Hey, my thing is this. Hey, here's what I wish we had done, and maybe it's unrealistic and maybe it's a pipe dream, but I wish we had just designated seven or eight people or shows or whatever and said, you know what? We're, we're not going to just stick our heads in the sand and pretend that this election didn't exist. We'll let the PTI guys talk about it. We'll let Mike and Mike talk about it. We'll let Simmons talk about it. You know, pick six, seven people and say these are the people. We, we've picked a very, a, a very group of people that are of different ages, of different sexes, of different colors, and they'll kind of be our coalition on just mentioning the election and, and at least pretending that it's happening. Well, this, you know what there, I mean? Yeah, there probably would have been da- ways to do that in might in the future, and you should lobby for it. It's a good idea, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are ways you could set that up, but I mean, then it's it's how do you clearly signal that to the fan as well? But here's what you. kills me: when we finally get involved with it, it's Stu Scott playing basketball with Obama for three minutes. I don't know what happened there. It's Chris Berman interviewing it at halftime, and then. I forget, oh, yeah, the, the Reggie Love piece was great on E60. Like, that was interesting. But then we had to counter it the next week with Cindy McCain. We had to do something, which I didn't even understand why that was on the show. But well, I don't know. I mean, it was to give an equal, you know, an aura of equal time. Even though, you know, there, there's not a mandate that they have to, it was to give an aura of equal time because they are concerned about uh, seeming on any given day, you know, uh, to be favoring one candidate or another. Mm. Not that such favor would swing an election, but that seeming to give such favor is really going to irritate the sports fan, uh, well, uh, some segment of sports fan. I do worry that they thought that because Obama was so in the ESPN wheelhouse, mm-hmm. he likes all the things that the average ESPN viewer yeah. would like. You know, he watches the shows. Like, I... I liked him, you know, forget about the politics. I just kind of liked him because I felt like I had something in common with him. Like, he liked the wire. He liked basketball. You know, and maybe they felt, compared to uh, John McCain, that that was, like, almost, like, too big of an advantage for Obama to use ESPN well, in that I think way. that probably was a concern, you know. Well, there, there was first, uh, before there were, in, in the period when it was still uh, of the primaries, yeah. they didn't want to do... Um, you know, they didn't want to do Obama without also doing Hillary, without also doing McCain. And so I think it was a reasonable decision to say we wait until the conventions when there's just one of each party. And then in that one of each party, you try to give them equal time. Yeah. Um, now that Obama's president, you know, you don't have anybody you have to give equal time to yet for four years. Yeah, I guess ESPN would have been as much of an advantage for Hillary in the primary. I don't, I don't think she's a huge sports fan, but I, I think it's going to be interesting the next four years for ESPN because Obama is the most sports-friendly president we've had, and yeah. you're looking at a situation where nobody's really talked about this yet. That the NBA team, like whatever team wins the NBA title this year, that team is going to be the most excited to meet the president of any team we've ever had. I mean, this is like, I yeah. actually could see it being like a rallying cry for some of these teams, like, you know, two more wins away from Obama, something like that. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how we, we cover that aspect of it. You know, whether, I feel like that's a big story. I, I've never seen I NBA will. guys. I think, I think there were, there were some pieces that were done at the time of the inauguration about, um, uh, how many athletes you know, how many black athletes and interviewing of them felt, you know, felt a relation to this president and to this campaign and to this period of history that, you know. Man. So what happens to you that? now? Do you start, do you start, uh, on budgranny.com and you just start cranking out sports columns? No. Blog I, think, posts? I doubt it. I don't know what happens next. Um, um, probably won't be sports. I tend to, um, you know, be a kind of like serial specialist, you know, right. and, and almost overdose. I feel a little bit at this point the way I did after I was sports editor of the Times that, you know, um, 
then I kind of overdosed and time to step back and make a corrective and and probably pursue some other interests. But uh, this is just my decompression time. I don't really know yet. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was kind of fun that the first thing I did, um, uh, work-related thing that I did uh, after being after the, you know, my last ombuds column, it just so happened coincidentally that I was invited to um, uh, introduce. Um, there's a place called the New York State Writers Institute in Albany. It's a terrific place. And they have a huge speaker series. And their speaker was uh, this woman, Elaine Showalter, who has just written um, a book that's being called Magisterial. You know, it's a, it's a book that surveys 350 years of writing by... American women from the Puritan poet and Bradstreet up until this moment. And mm. they needed somebody to kind of, you know, to introduce her and converse with her during the course of a day's worth of things at the New York State Writers Institute, and they asked me to do it. So I went straight from being sort of the sheriff of Boyland to plunging myself into this 500 and some page book about the history of American women writers and then presenting sort of the lady English literature academic persona <laughs> five days later. And I kind of got a kick out of that. And where between those two extremes I will land um, for my next, you know, venture, I have no idea. And I, I said, but I've been doing this for 20, ever since that time I said, I resign, and they said, you can't. And then it got postponed by the book, you know, and then I went to the book review, and then finally after the book review, I said, this is the best job, and yet I'd rather just be out on my own, following my own lights, and knock on wood, that was 1984, so uh, all this time I have just kind of made it up as I went along, and it's worked. I like that title for your blog as well, The Sheriff of Boyland. Yeah. <laughs> I think that could work for your blog. You think so? <laughs> Either that or the ombud granny or whatever. Yeah. You know, I think every 30 years you come back to sports. Okay. So when you're in your, in your 90s. Yeah. Which will be like 2038. Yeah. I think you make another reappearance. Could be. Could be. Well, we've kept our streak alive. Yeah. You and I, I have now, you and I have now. I'd probably hide John Walsh, huh? <laughs> no, we're, I think we're going to split this up into two parts, but. You, uh, you and I have talked three times now, and each conversation has lasted an hour or more. I, uh, I don't know what is it about us. It's probably your fault. It's probably my fault. Thank you for coming on. Best of luck in your next ventures. In my life. pleasure. And congrats on a, really a great job as the ombudsman. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Two more. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. And that concludes another episode of the BS Report. And here's 55 more words that Bill Simmons intended to mention but unfortunately ran out of time. Now you can get any regular Pile High Subway foot long for just $5. The keyword is any. The sweet onion chicken teriyaki, savory chicken and bacon ranch, the meaty taste bud pleasing Italian BMT. All the regular famous Subway foot longs, just $5. Subway, eat fresh. See store for details.